Thank you very much. Thanks for the invite to be here. I'm delighted to be talking to people face to face and seeing people again I haven't seen for years, so it's great to be here. I'm going to start from a different place, but I suspect I might end up where Manolis ended up as well, but we'll start. So the use of intelligent liver function testing, or ILFT in general practice, and this is the beauty of Dundee, so if you want to come and visit us, you're very welcome, and if the next conference is here. I want to tell you a story. I'm going to start with abnormal liver function tests and quality of care, which is what we're about to our patients. Move on to early diagnosis of liver disease, doing it cost effectively, and then moving on to what does it mean about NAFLD and how we can move forward with that. So I am struck by the graph on the top. This is Scottish Hospital admissions due to liver disease up to 2015, and the graph carries on from here on. These are age quintiles or deciles, I think, um, for the thing. And in contrast to almost every other disease you want to look at, that small blue bar at the top is the over 65s. The mass number of people are under 65. This is a disease of what I would regard as young people. Some of you might disagree. <laughs> so that's the first thing. And this is UK data at the bottom, which you've probably seen this graph before. This is deaths in the under 65s, age standardized to 1970. And it's going up. Everything else has got better. Are we really crap as hepatologists? Um, do the diabetologists and anyone else that's associated with us want anything to do with us if we're that bad at looking after our disease? The reality is it's got much more common, as we all know, and it's being driven by alcohol and it's being driven by non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and the overlap between the two. Coming from Scotland, we have a problem with the concept of non-alcohol. <laughs> so if we look back at liver function tests, I'm struck by, you know, as a practicing hepatologist in theater in the middle of the night waiting for my patient to arrive so I can band their varices. You flick back through their records, and there is that liver function tests in the past where nothing has been done. So if you look at our work in Tayside, where we looked at abnormal liver function tests, between 2019, uh, 1989 and 2007, we performed incident liver function tests on 310,000 individual patients. In our part of Scotland, there were only 550,000 people ever alive in that region during that time. We are testing LFTs on an industrial scale. It just happens. Every time blood is taken, the box gets ticked. If you look within general practice, 95,000 of them had an... Oh. <laughs> I'm that bad, people are leaving already. <laughs> 95,000 people in general practice having their incident liver function tests, 21% had at least one abnormality. Less than 50% were investigated. We have all written the guidelines. We've all seen the guidelines. We know what we should be doing with them. It's not being done. The grim statistics. So when I'm sat, sat there in that theatre room waiting to, for my patient, 70% of our patients will present for the first time ever with their jaundice, with their variceal bleed, or with ascites. That's their first presentation to us. That's our first chance. And in the UK, 25% of them will be dead within 60 days. If you, if, you are pre if you present with compensated liver disease, your median survival is 12 years. If you present with decompensation, the median survival is less than two years. That's what we need to do about this disease. There is no point in sitting on our ass. The so what question, that's the so what. If we do nothing, people die. We need to find who we need to do it to, and there's all of those complications, but that's what we need to tackle. So let's get back to liver function tests. Normal liver function tests are not normal. We know that. LFTs don't measure liver function. Abnormal liver function tests don't mean liver disease. The size of the abnormality doesn't matter. Our GP colleagues will be very concerned if they've got an ALT of 2,000. Most of us in this room would be singularly unimpressed. However, an ALT of 57, we might be more interested in, particularly if we know what the AST is. And then, of course, there is the problem of why did anyone measure them in the first place, which gives hepatologists this mystic meg of hepatology where we have our tea leaves or our crystal ball trying to predict what's going to happen. So what's the problem? What do the primary care physicians want? How does, does, does this result help me manage my patient? What's the cause of this abnormality? Do I need to do anything with this? Make this problem go away. I can't remember why I did the test, but I just want it not to be a problem anymore. And what do hepatologists want? 
we perhaps want to start touching on the early diagnosis of fibrosis that we were talking about just in the questioning and the detection of pre-fibrotic liver disease or the detection of fibrosis where we now have definite things we're going to do about it all. But we don't want our clinics flooded. As uh, Dr. Nussi has told us already this morning or this afternoon, there are thousands and thousands of people, only an itty bitty tiny fraction of them have been diagnosed. If we found them all in one go, we would all be very, very, very busy for a very long time. So it's how we find the right people. So what's the answer? We have guidelines. You've all seen the guidelines. I am partly responsible for these ones. And I was very proud when I gave them to my wife, who's a GP, and said, here, I've helped you solve your problem. She hit me with them. <laughs> GPs have piles of these guidelines for every disease, stacked up, falling over, or their hard drives are full of them as we move into the digital age. So they're not really very helpful. They are precise for those people that will wander through them. But in a seven-minute consultation in primary care, it's not going to get used. So what do we want to do? We've got lots of algorithms, and Manolis has shown us a lovely one. Um, we could focus about diagnosis and having everyone in a box, but liver disease is messy, it's difficult, and it ends up with those diagrams that we've just seen. Is it all just about fibrosis? and nothing else matters and we just do a fibrosis test, which if we're looking for the management of cirrhosis may be true, but as we have diseases evolving from MAFLD, trying to get weight loss in a cirrhotic is too late. Trying to multi manage their multimorbidities is too late if we're just focusing on fibrosis, so do we need to do things earlier? So how was ILFT developed and how does it work and how we sort things out from there? So I locked a whole load of hepatologists in a room and gave them lots of coffee. They weren't terribly productive. I added chocolate biscuits and things got better. <laughs> so expert working group, we gave them minimal information. So they had a liver screen, so liver function tests, the conventional liver screen that we're all familiar with, calculation of fibrosis scores, uh, the Fib4 and the NAPL fibrosis score, and they had the patient's alcohol intake, whether they had features of the metabolic syndrome and their BMI. And we asked them to make as many diagnoses as they could based on those information, that information and thresholds. So if you do that, you come up with 32 diagnostic outcomes. And you're able to allocate patients into three broad groups. One is those with definite liver disease or advanced fibrosis from a common liver disease and needs referral. Patients that can be managed in primary care with low fibrosis scores but a definite diagnosis. And a group of the God only knows. So we are unable to come up with a diagnosis. Now, we designed these criteria to fail safe. We wanted to build a lot of confidence around them because we were going to enforce them on our GP colleagues, and we wanted them to work. And so we took a hard diagnosis of NAFLD. So you had to have be obese, so BMI over 30, and you had to have two features of the metabolic syndrome. Okay, So that's a particularly harsh diagnosis for, for fatty liver disease. What else did we need to make this work? We needed advanced information technology, so an order comm system that you could put the order into the lab as to what you wanted to do. That had to be electronic, so you could add in that information about your BMI, your alcohol, and your metabolic syndrome. A laboratory information management system and a data management system within the lab. Every single lab you work with has those systems in place, all of them. And our, the brain of this sits in your laboratory information management system. If you have an old one, you are in luck because there will be someone in your lab who can reprogram it to do what I'm going to show you happens. If you've got a new fancy one, they're not quite so hackable. So you have to then pay the company to um, do it for you. They'll charge you about £30,000 for the privilege. Decision support tools and the, the software that's available with those will also do this for you. You need a tract analyzer, so the blood arrives in the lab, it's not touched by human hands, it runs around on the track. The program that controls that has the ability to change the direction and the destination of that blood in real time. So if the ALT, the outfoss, or the gamma GT is abnormal, or the bilirubin is abnormal, it can cascade a whole series of additional tests. So the whole liver screen is done on that single sample of blood that came into the lab if you set up for intelligent liver function testing. There is nothing fancy about the lab that we work with in Tayside. All of you are working in institutions that can do that. We had a multidisciplinary approach, and we programmed those algorithms and those rules about diagnosis that I extracted with chocolate biscuits from the hepatologists. 
into the computer. So it sits in the laboratory information management system and gives us that, those results and processes that in real time. So what does that look like? This is our order comm system. This is ICE, which is made by ClinSys, which is one of the standard systems in place across the U UK. And you select the intelligent liver function pathway. You can tick the intelligent liver function pathway or the fibrosis scores. The fibrosis scores are for follow-up. So when Manolis wants it done again in two years, one year, or whenever, that's the box they use for doing that. And then the GP is presented with this screen with those choices on it. And they fill it in, and they send it to the lab. The blood sample labels are printed out. The phlebotomist takes the blood. The blood goes to the lab. In the lab, there's this complicated algorithm that sits within the, uh, in the brain of the laboratory information management system. You don't need to worry about that. The biochemists will program that for you. What comes out? So within four hours, this is returned to the GP. So at the top, you've got a short code with the diagnosis worked out from there. All the blood results are the, as, the conventional, uh, as the conventional results that you would see, and the suggested management at the bottom as to what the GP should do. If they press on the hyperlink to that, they're taken to a management information sheet that tells them in detail what they should do, and a link to print out a patient information management system that they can hand, or leaflet that they can hand to the patient. It removes the cracks. There is no chance of a patient being missed because the blood go, as soon as the blood leaves the patient and goes to the lab, if they have a liver disease, if they have fatty liver disease, you can get them all. And they're then in general practice, and your system is identified, and you can reach in and reach those patients if you want. And you can then write your own referral rules as to which ones you want to see and which ones you want to leave in general practice, and advise the general practitioners as to what to do them, with them all. So that's just the, the link to the information. And so that's ILIFT, alcohol-related liver disease without fibrosis. So if the results are normal on that initial blood test, it's standard care. They get the results back, nothing happens. If the results are abnormal, all of the screen is done as reflex testing for the standard screen, and a real-time report is generated back to the general practitioner. Seamless, and you can't escape the system. We're all familiar from our working uh, hepatitis C, the cascades of care. You're going to have the same barriers and the same difficulties bringing patients with alcohol-related liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease towards care because they're going to be, there's going to be stigma attached to both those diseases as well. What happens when you test this in the real world? So in the top graph, that's the final outcome in the control group. So this was a step wedge trial. So we had... 67 general practitioners who knew they were in a trial, they had all volunteered to be in a trial, and they knew we were going to check up on what they did with liver function testing. 50% of them didn't investigate abnormal liver function tests. Keen, enthusiastic general practitioners who had volunteered to be in a trial, 50% didn't investigate abnormal liver function tests. Didn't do what the guidelines say. That's the reality and that's the real world, which you're all familiar with. You put ILFT in, and suddenly 97% of patients get the samples done, etc., and the whole process happens. And so you increase your diagnosis rate from 16% to 56%. You've still got lots of patients that aren't diagnosed yet because we've left them with descriptive test, tests and outcomes, but you've got a management plan for the GPs as to what they should be doing next and how they explore those patients further going forward. There is an 80% reduction in GP contacts. Because if you think about that sequence of they go to see the GP, the liver tests are abnormal, they come back to see the GP, they have a chat about the liver function test, they do the liver function test again. They're still abnormal. Or if they have normalized, you should still be investigating them because we'll talk about that in a second. So that changes up and down. So it reduces those six average visits that would take you to get to the end of that diagnostic pathway, making it happen in one. Okay. If you look at the cost effectiveness, it's, save, it's cost saving to the NHS by a tune of about £3,200. The ISA was an increase of £284, which is the difference between only investigating 50% of your patients and investigating all of your patients properly. So if you look at what happened when we put that in the real world, having done the trial, this is the first 4,194 requests that came through in the first nine months of the system working. 
you can see how quickly general practice got behind it because it was making their life easy. This is a win-win. You don't have to work hard. So 1,000 patients, no cascade. We had 4,000 outcomes. People have more than one disease. Surprise, surprise. And alcohol and fat live together. 73% could be managed in primary care. 23% were identified for a secondary care referral. And of the secondary care referrals, 70% were for the second stage testing around fibrosis. Okay? Being practical and a canny Scots person by adoption, we stole Manolis's idea. You will be surprised to know that uh, ELF works very well. And if you apply ELF to those tests, you can, depending where you put your deadline, this is the, the histogram of all the values. So we chose 9.8 for the people that were above that would come for fibro scan. Below 9.8 would um, stay in primary care and get lifestyle advice and monitoring of their cardiovascular risks. And you can put that point. All of the rules around this, you can change to suit your system, where you want your cutoffs. And clearly, if we find a wonder drug that you need a lower cutoff or a higher cutoff, you can change it. So that brings us on to case finding, which Nolas is starting to catch up on. I've re told you those fig dire figures already. Is liver function testing enough to find everybody? Do we need a mixed combination of uh, factors to try and bring people forward? Um, abnormal liver function tests, routine LFTs, it's already in the system. It works well. Ab the ALT value that we have and work with is probably wrong, and we need to change that. But however, you're going to miss the patients that never have their liver function tests done because you're not going to find them. And you can clearly get cirrhosis with normal LRTs even under the new normal ranges because as people come towards advanced stage, they have less liver mass. If we look at risk factors, so alcohol intake or how many, or um, under, sorry, sorry, under the box is the uh, risk factors of the metabolic syndrome. So what combination of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia do we want? Is it one will get you into the system, or do you need two or three? Clearly, uh, colleagues before me have presented data showing that there's a cumulative effect. And we're going to lose people in the cascades of care, so we want these things as tight as possible so we don't lose people in the cracks. And there is more than one etiology possible, particularly in Scotland. So we need to be adaptive to how we use them and not thinking in isolation. We need to think not only about the cardiovascular risks, etc., but the other risk factors for their liver. So what's happening around the United Kingdom in terms of, um, I think this is uh, the basis of a systematic review that has just been published this week in Lancet Gastroenterology and HEP. Basically, you've got abnormal fun liver function test-based screening, either the automated type 1s from Gwent in Wales with Andy Yeoman, or our systems in, uh, I in IFT, which are now running in four health boards and three, two English health districts, and so are being rolled out progressively. You've got the clinical suspicion pathways, and you've got the risk factor pathways um, along the way, and all of those pathways, and the non-automated version of abnormal liver function tests where the GPs act going forward. Let's think specifically now about NAFLD and MAFLD and how we work the two together. Changing the MAFLD, as we move towards MAFLD, and I realize I'm stepping into a hornet's nest of controversy here at the moment, and I'll find out who my friends are by how many ma uh, num knives I have in my back. Um, if we have a MAFL type diagnosis, it allows us to make a positive diagnosis rather than the negative diagnosis. So it makes it easier to, el to electrify that type of diagnostic cascade so we can put it into those algorithms within the process and so makes it easier. Now, abnormal liver function tests, we all know this is old data, but it's still valid that if you have, depend on an abnormal ALT, you will miss a large amount of NAFLs because it's not abnormal enough. However, Manolis comes to our rescue. He did it once and showed us that our normal ranges were wrong. Um, and then he did it again when the International Federation of Clinical Chemists changed their methodology and updated it all. So the true normal ranges are 30 for women and 42 for men in terms of upper limits of normal. Most of us are working with lab values at 55 or higher, depending on the methodology that's used, because of difficulties with quality control between the clinical chemists, and we need to get them out of that. So if you use those lower normal ranges, and we've gone for 30 in ILFT, what happens? You find a whole load more liver disease. So this is the dark blue, let me get this right, the dark blues are ALTs between 31 and 55, and the light blues are ALTs 
of 55, you can see you find almost as many patients above and below that threshold with fibrosis that if you didn't look for it at all. And if you move on, and you find a larger number of patients of those with abnormal liver function tests, which are described rather than positively diagnosed because of the problems around the NAFL diagnosis, which we could solve by moving to NAFL. So that's where you're starting to find lots of patients that you're missing because of that 55 cutoff. This is for fibrosis, and you can see that in those NAFL and MAFL patients, you are finding 50% more patients with fibrosis that you would be missing if you stayed to that trigger point of the 55. So while you won't find them all, you will find substantially more of them if you get the right normal ranges as your trigger point. One way of trying to get MAFL better is to think about, do we, rather than relying on our general practice colleagues for filling in that key bit of data about whether they've got features of the metabolic syndrome or their BMI, which is largely unreliable, because when we've gone back and looked at the data and searched the databases ourselves, 50% of the patients, or 75% of the patients with abnormal ALT and get a descriptive outcome actually have the metabolic syndrome, and it's obvious in their records. And that leaves you the 25% who have the metabolic syndrome or, yet, already but haven't been formally diagnosed yet. They haven't had the rest of the analysis done to allow them to have that diagnosis, and NAFLD is the first part of their diagnostic criteria. Can we use HbA1c in that threshold between being overtly diabetic and being normal, is that area going to give us some of that information about identifying the patients that we need to reach? Clearly, if they've got an abnormal HbA1c that you could add on to the cascade, that will work. And that's where we're taking the next phase. So in conclusion, automated diagnosis and staging of MAFL from LFTs is possible. It's using existing technology. It's just working smarter. It's not rocket science. It's adding a bit of programming into the infrastructure you've already got. Whether the optimum combination is the right one to do, Manolis and I are working very hard on giving you the answer to that question. And hopefully, if you invite us back when this workshop next convenes, we'll share with you how far we've got with answering that question as to what the combination is you need to find them. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.